Hello, 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 gorgeous human. I listen to podcasts. I watch YouTube videos. That's the type of person that I am. So I am not only a maker of them, but I'm also a consumer of them. And my favorite type is when the YouTuber or the creator of the said content does like an in-depth talk to me, you know, let's have a conversation varietal. And that is what we're going to do today. I asked you on my Instagram to throw out a couple of personal questions. Some of them are gonna be about me, my routines, all of those things. We're going to get deep and personal and meaningful. A lot of them are gonna be on the topics that you are used to me talking about, like feminine energy and things like that, but it's gonna be a little more intimate. And I've not looked at these questions as of yet, so we are going to delve into them together. How do you balance being a mom and now running all your social media accounts? By social media accounts, this person means my Instagram, my YouTube, my podcast, all of the things that are going on at the moment. And the honest truth is, I think if hmm, I saw this piece of content today about the fact that if you think you can balance motherhood and work, and do it both at 100%, you are going to be sadly mistaken and disappointed, and I couldn't agree more. I think you cannot give 100% to both. Some of them will have to be less attended to, but I will say this, for anyone who's considering becoming a parent or who is a parent, I have not created more, I have not been more productive, and I have not been more on the pulse as I have been since having my son three years ago and now being pregnant. I don't know whether it's because having a child gives you meaning and I know that everyone who's not got a child just wants to smack me across the face right now or whatever it is, but the reality is that for some people and for me included, and I think that's because I had my children in my 30s, so just at the start of my 30s with my son, and now I'm gonna have a daughter, I think I had the perspective of I need to do something amazing, or maybe it just aligned at the same time, but I definitely feel this level of motivation coming from having had him. I feel like I've got to be a role model in some ways, and I said when I didn't know the gender of my second child that if it is a girl, I feel even more pressure to do so, and everyone was like, why? What's the difference? But I genuinely feel like showing up as a woman in this world, all I've got to do is love my son and it's his father's role to kind of show him how to be a man. But now I've got to show this girl how to be a woman in this world. And half of the time, as much as I read about it, learn about it, talk to you guys about it, we're all stumbling through it, aren't we? And some things I don't know what the right thing is to do, like social media and body image and all of these things that are just so difficult to address and so difficult to combat, I don't always know because we haven't lived through this. We haven't lived through the accessibility that we have to everybody online, measuring up against everybody. And I don't know how that's going to impact a young a female mind, but yes, how do I manage it was the question and how do I balance it? I don't balance it. I just, number one, I feel motivated by it. I feel motivated that I've got to show up as someone in this world. And I, my son goes to preschool three days a week. And in that time, I manage to create lists and to create goal setting and to create succinct flow in how I make these things happen. What I used to achieve in a, in a week prior to having children, I now achieve in a day or half a day. For example, if I have a call with America, I have to schedule it at 6 a.m. my time before my son wakes up. Technically, time-wise, I could do it at 8 a.m., I could do it at 7 a.m., I could do it at 9 or 10. But when he's up, there is no Zoom call that you're going to be having, my friend. There is absolutely no Zoom call. So you have to make sacrifices in timing, you have to make sacrifices in what fits into your life, and you just have to work with it from there. Is this pregnancy harder than your first? For those who don't know again, I'm pregnant again. I'm about eight months pregnant, hence why if you can hear me laboring to breathe, this is the thing they don't tell you ladies. It's like Christmas dinner. You've just had Christmas dinner. You've just had the dessert for Christmas dinner. 
you had the dessert after the dessert, the little bit of candy or whatever, and you can't breathe. That is the biggest feeling that I would describe like pregnancy to you like in the third trimester. You literally feel like I remember going to lunch with a friend of mine. She's like, wow, you're really not eating much. Like you should, you know, you should eat more because, you know, you're eating for two. I'm like, girl, I am trying to eat for two, but nothing fits. Like my stomach is here. I had a, a scan of my liver and all this stuff during my pregnancy because I was getting some stabbing pain and they were scanning my chest. They were scanning my chest to see where my liver is. That's how much the baby's moved up. But is my pregnancy harder than my first? This pregnancy has ironically, and I don't know why, maybe my daughter is a kinder person than my son because he is a crazy boy, but um, I felt better. I don't know if I felt better because I'm busier. My mind is more occupied. I don't know if I felt better because I, because genuinely hormonally between a girl and a girl, there isn't much difference. And he, with a boy, I guess hormone shifts were different. Or I don't know whether it's because, I don't know, it's just my body now knows what it's doing. But I did have hyperemesis, which I have videos on my YouTube channel about. And if you want to look for that, just search my name and write HG, which is a severe form of sickness, which you just throw everything up. You can't even drink water. I had that, but it was better managed this time because I guess my healthcare providers knew that I'm prone to that fun, fun, fun thing. Are you going to take a break from work once you give birth? First of all, for all curious minds, I am going to have a C-section. Why? Because I want some element of control. <laughs> no, because I had a C-section with my first son, Leo. And with this one, they recommend a C-section again. I don't want to do all natural birth. I don't want any of that. I just want for something to be... I had the most peaceful, positive C-section experience. It was almost um, zen and spiritual like. I think because my first pregnancy was so turbulent, I was so extremely sick. I was on IVs every three days because I couldn't drink or eat that at the end I was like, relent, relent me, like do this for me. I don't want to do this. Someone take the wheel, Jesus or the surgeon, take the wheel and I want you to do this for me because <laughs> just I can't. So will I take time off? It having, the, the idea, the fact that it is a C-section is the premise that I'll have to stay in hospital for five days. Will you see me take that time off is a different story and probably not. I'm trying my hardest and damnedest to batch content. This video is probably gonna be coming out and this um, podcast is going to be coming out maybe end of November. I could have had the baby by then, we don't know. We don't know, maybe I didn't, but I'm hoping you won't see any difference in content, but I am hoping I will be able to take two to three weeks off. Keeping in mind, when I had my first child, it was the biggest shock that I've ever experienced in my life. It was the biggest shock I've ever experienced in my life. I, he was a colic baby. He cried 24 seven. We couldn't go to a cafe, we couldn't go out. It was COVID. I am excited to try a different experience with having a child. I'm genuinely excited about it. Like I did not have a very normal, there is no normal. There is no such thing as normal in children or anything, but I'm hoping she'll be a reasonable woman. I'm hoping that she will, you know, sleep in a cafe. I'm always hopeful. I'm a hopeful human being. I always look forward to the, you know, the bright side of things. And I want to do a non-COVID post-birth. Like I couldn't see anyone for six months. We were in lockdown. So it was very much trial by fire. Will you raise your daughter and son differently? Look, it's a very, it's a very interesting question because raising a daughter and a son differently, even if you don't want to raise them differently, you will have unsuspecting biases and ideas that you have in your head, even if you are the most Oak parent and you just want to them to be exactly the same you don't even want them to know that they have a gender you will have biases that you don't know they will come out in ways that you didn't even know they come out in like for example for some reason when you were growing up say you're female your brother was mean to you or something like that something will come out it's not that you've got to tell them like boys don't cry or things like that it's not going to be so obvious but there will be biases 
So I am mature enough to say that, yes, I will raise my daughter and my son differently, but I'm not going to be sitting here and saying, my daughter's gonna fly in business class while my son flies in economy because men thrive and struggle, even though I do believe that. And I don't believe that all men thrive and struggle and we should all throw them into struggle and then they will climb out of it heroic, like the movie 300. No, I'm not saying that. And I also have beliefs that a man is not a child and a man is not a boy. So I'm raising my son with a lot of empathy, a lot of emotion. I'm there for him. I am constantly um, observing his, his emotional state. I don't treat him differently than I would treat a girl, but there will come a time later in life that I know this world, and I believe masculine and feminine don't thrive in the same way. I believe that he will thrive in different scenarios. And I also believe that um, the biggest role in a boy's life is his father. So it's very much up to his father to, to, to raise him how he will and for me to love him. And it's very much up to me to raise my daughter how I will and for her father to love him, because that is the biggest thing. If a girl is loved by her father and she is told that she is special in all these ways and she, you know, just, just genuinely loved by him, she's got the best chance in life with self-esteem, with how she sees men. I know learning it the hard way that I didn't have that and it took 30 years to build my self-esteem. So, and I still struggle. So the, the opposite gender parent just has to love the child. I think this will be the last one about the children, but maybe not, I don't know, maybe this is what everyone wants to know about, but how did I deal with postpartum? I did not get postpartum depression. Um, I don't know how because I was in COVID and it was hard and my baby had colic, which means they just scream all the time. But how did I deal with it? I didn't deal with it. I just robustly, mercilessly slung myself through it. I couldn't get nannies at the time because Australia was in lockdown. I couldn't get any kind of doulas or anything because we couldn't get that. And I didn't have my mum or my parents around. So. It was just like trial by fire. I just got through it and I'm not sure how, I don't have very strong memories of it, but I am both nervous and apprehensive of how it will happen this time and if I can implement better strategies. I will obviously try and hire someone. I don't know how to hire a nanny. It seems that it's harder to hire a nanny than it is to find a husband in these streets like it is so difficult to find someone you trust. And if you don't have children, it's like if you imagine somebody had to hold one of your vital organs for you all day while you go about doing something else. Like, hi, here's my liver. You hold it. Here's my heart. Here's my whatever lungs. And I'm just going to go about my business. And this random person has to look after your literal life source. That is what it feels like to hire a nanny. And finding one is difficult, but if I want to maintain working and doing everything and sleeping, because with the type of child I had the first time, I'm preempting that my second will be the same because you just have to, you know, prepare or you'll prepare to fail, you know, fail to prepare or you prepare to fail. So assuming that she won't sleep and she'll just scream, I'll need a nanny to take her for an hour while I record this podcast for you, honey. And things like that. Do I have siblings? No, I do not have any siblings. My mum had me and thought I did a perfect job and that is enough. No, I'm joking. My mum and my dad split up when I was five years old and my mum got into a new relationship when she was in her late 40s or mid 40s. So she never met a partner with whom she wanted to have children. And let's just be realistic. She didn't really want more than one. Do you follow any kind of diet and what is your self-care routine? The diet that I follow before this was the paleo slash keto diet. I found that it suits me so well to be on a high protein, higher fat diet because it's satiating and it made me feel good. Whereas a lot of people, I, I think it's so individual. A lot of my friends who have amazing bodies and amazing physiques thrive on a vegan diet, vegetarian, whatever it might be, high carb. Me, my body loves to burn fat or protein for fuel. And I felt my best when I eat too many things. And I really fall into this 
pattern quite easily where I start to eat like a pastry or this or that and I know the recommended thing is like eat what you want don't develop any kind of you know habits about this and that don't get too overwhelmed with it but for me I like rules I like rules because I thrive in them and I like structure because I thrive in that otherwise I just get too messy and I, I don't know what's going on so for me a structure like I'm gonna eat protein I'm gonna eat vegetables I also include some berries and fruit and I love dairy I love protein meats yogurt fish things like that I really thrive on that and essentially if I was to summarize my beliefs in eating is you should eat natural food and non-processed food that's basically it things around that like I can handle dairy you might not be able to and the ins and outs of that is very personal but for me that is the diet since being pregnant it really throws me and I hope my thyroid doesn't have a conniption like it did last time with my son but I got hyperthyroid which is the fast one so people who talked to me they didn't see me because it was locked down but people who talked to me after I had my son thought I was on some kind of Adderall or something they thought I developed some kind of ADHD because my thyroid was so hyper. I was like twitchy, crazy, just insane. So yes, I hope it doesn't do that, but I'm hoping to go back to a keto diet after my daughter's here. The reason that pregnancy really throws me though is because in my first three to four months, I can't eat or drink anything. And when you can't eat or drink anything, you don't care about salads, you don't care about protein, you don't care about anything. I could, I just ate crackers, bits of donut, some kind of random crumb. I threw it up anyway. Basically, sorry to be graphic, everyone who's listening, but I ate things that were easy to throw up because everything would come up anyway. Isn't that fun? Would love to know your morning and nighttime routine as well as spiritual practice, if any. I would say the closest thing I have to a spiritual practice in all honesty is gratitude. I think that's the thing that's got me furthest in life. I think a shift happened in my success, in my career, in my life, in my marriage, in my relationship, in clarity in all ways came when I started to deeply understand and feel gratitude in my life. I felt very, very grateful for things, specific things, not random things, not like I'm just grateful to be alive and I'm grateful I have a home. I wrote down three things I'm grateful for every night before I went to bed for six months and that is when my life, I don't know, I got clarity. It was like I knew what I wanted to do, I knew where I wanted to go, I knew the type of person I wanted to appear as in the world, I knew what kind of content I wanted to create all of it it was almost like a manifestation practice but spiritually wise gosh i never even know if i've ever addressed this but god and spirituality wise i am connected to something i'm not going to go into um any denomination because i wasn't really raised like that so i don't didn't really believe in it but um i went to a school a church school church of england school and obviously i am orthodox being eastern european i'm russian orthodox but I never went to church with my mom or had a practice doing that. But I do have a spirituality. As far as morning and nighttime routines, look, girl, I've got to be honest. I had, I love listening to people's nighttime routine and morning routine, but every day with me is a little bit different. And I love when people come on and they say, my morning routine is no phone till 10 a.m. And I meditate and then I you know, do my yoga and then I do some kind of downward dog and then, you know, I go into my ice bath and then I do some kind of foam rolling and that's all fantastic. But like I said, to me, at 6 a.m. is when I can take my calls with America because I'm in Australia. To me, 6 a.m. is when I can talk to my mom because she lives in London. To me, that's when I can reply to all my friends who are abroad. And to me, that is my time like before my son wakes up if he wakes up at eight I have two hours to do a lot of business and to do a lot of work and I know that's not sustainable and I know that might cause cause burnout and I know I should be sitting in a lotus meditating and I know I should be writing gratitude journals but that's just not the reality of my life and 
backing up onto that question when you asked about routines and and like how I space out my work day and all these accounts I am I wake up at 6 a.m and I am either on a zoom call or I am emailing my editor about the latest video that I want her to edit or the website being down or one of my master classes having a sale or doing that then I talk to my mum for maybe half an hour and then when my son wakes up I try and be present for him because if I've been meditating and maybe look maybe I will change maybe I won't look at my phone until 11 o'clock and then only do all those things but I find that when I have done what I need to for me and in this portion of my life like my 30s are about building something my 30s are about building literally my children with my body in my body and they're about building my businesses my 20s were about fun and self-discovery and a lot of trial and tribulation and a lot of angst and just fabulousness like i went on a lot of holidays with my i met my husband when i was 24 and you know we fought a lot and traveled a lot <laughs> like that was it but our 30s is not our 30s because he's in his 40s but my 30s is about building and just really head down and doing that so I feel more present for my son after I've done two hours of talking to my mum, which is important to me. She is one of my closest friends, if not the closest person to me. I feel more present and grounded if I have answered all my emails, if I have progressed. It's, it's like I talked to you in a previous podcast, I believe, or one of my YouTube videos where I said to you, what moves the needle? Like literally, what is the one thing in your goals that moves the needle you need to be doing something that moves the needle every day it might be small like if your goal is to grow your hair and that small goal is not washing it every day then that is you moving the needle that is you moving the needle every day okay i didn't wash my hair today and for me right now i'm growing this podcast i'm growing my community i'm growing my child and so if i feel i've gone onto my emails i've put out some fires I've planned a few things. I am more ready. I'm more present with my son. Same in the evening. He goes to bed at eight o'clock and I do a lot of those things too. When he used to nap, I used to, you know, address work as well. But as far as routines, the few magic things that I will tell you is when you first wake up, drink a warm slash hot lemon water or apple cider vinegar that will flush your system that gets rid of toxins, that will make you beautiful, that will enhance your life. Do it, if you don't do it, you don't know. So do it, that's the first thing. I then always have a black coffee and I'm normally on my emails in bed um, having this lemon water. I didn't have lemons this morning, so it was just hot water and I was like, my lemons are gone. And then I have a black coffee, it's always black. Even now when I'm pregnant and I'm having decaf, it's just black coffee, no sugar. I hate additives. I hate additives and things in general. If I'm drinking, I'm drinking, I'm not talking about in pregnancy, but I'm just talking about additives. Like if I'm drinking, it's vodka on the rocks. It's tequila on the rocks. At best it's a martini or it's a wine. It's a one thing, like why are we making it a cocktail? Why are we making it complicated? It's not, it's not, it's not so deep. If it's coffee, it's gotta be black. It's gotta be no sugar. If it's tea, it's gotta be black tea. It was made and fermented to be the way it's meant to be. Stop ruining it. So I will have my black coffee for breakfast. If I'm not being silly and eating some kind of croissant or some kind of snail, which is like a curly version of a croissant. I got into that habit when I was sick and it was the only thing I could stomach. I ideally would have full fat dairy yogurt with some kind of blueberries or strawberries and eggs. That is the routine. Skincare every day. I've started to use a very basic skincare, just like CeraVe or, some, or QV because I don't want to overcomplicate pregnancy skincare at the moment. Let me tell you though, baby, let me tell you one thing. Once this daughter is out, let me tell you, I'm going to do lasers. I am going to do active ingredients. I'm going to do it all because I'm sick of walking around non-Botoxed and crusty. And if you're non-Botoxed, I'm not calling you crusty, but I'm feeling crusty. Like, let me tell you my app the other day not the other day two months ago because i'm now eight months pregnant but 
at the time, my app said to me, wow, you've spent half a year pregnant at six months. And I was like, half a year, half a year. The audacity of how long it takes to make a child is just audacious, just audacious. Tell me how you manage a routine of taking care of the house and going to the gym. Baby girl, I have not gone to the gym. I have not seen Jim. Jim and I have not been friends since I got pregnant because I was so sick that I didn't want to throw up on the people, you know, at Pilates in the gym. With the household, that is the thing that I let go most of. By the way, when I say household, I don't mean cooking or looking after my loved ones because that is very high priority for me. But let's say right now behind me is San Pellegrino box that I could unpack and put, put really nicely in the fridge like the Kardashians. But instead I'm doing this video and podcast. I am replying to emails and I'm going to do some business and some work. And if I had to see a friend, I'd prioritize the friend. I believe I amplify myself more with connection and communication than with that box standing there. That's not, that's not to say that that is everybody. Some people need that box cleared away, but I would rather make money and hire people to do the things that I don't want to do. One of those is cleaning the house. So I have somebody come every fortnight, clean the house, doing a deep clean of things that I am just tragic at and don't want to be better at because I would rather work more and make more money. And I love those TikTok videos where girls are like amazing at cleaning. They just clean. They are like this, like they spray the thing. They do the thing. I don't know what they do, but they are just so incredible. And I love it. And I love that for you. I'm like that with cooking. I love cooking. Some people don't like cooking. I'm like, don't learn to cook. Outsource, outsource everything that does not serve you. But when I'm not pregnant, I did Pilates three times a week. And after I am not pregnant, I am really wanting to start weight training. I really, really want to give that a go because it really changes your constitution. Are you still in love with yourself? I don't know if that question was a facetious one, if it was a spicy question, or if it was a genuine, like, are you in love with yourself question, but I will answer it honestly. And that is, I have tried to cultivate love for myself, my whole life, and it is not easy. And am I still is the wrong phrasing because I guess the better phrasing would be, have I found love for myself? And I'm working on it every day, baby girl. Like it is the thing, isn't it? I think love for yourself comes from actions that serve you. For example, doing the things you love for yourself like you would for a person you love. So I'm trying to show myself love every day. How did your relationship with you and your husband grow and develop and how does he feel about you giving all the secrets away and blessing your other women with the secrets? Number one, my husband has never watched a piece of my content. My husband is the most interesting person in terms of like, he does not want to know other people's business. And I know this isn't other people's business. This is literally his wife. But when I'm like, oh, don't you want to see what I'm talking about? He's like, I've seen you talk around me often enough that I don't need to listen to your podcast. How does he feel about it? Happy for me because he thinks I have a lot to say and that I'm intelligent, I guess, is his, what he says is his favorite quality of mine. Um, I don't believe him. But, you know, he says it to be nice. And how has our relationship changed? We were butting heads and fighting the whole beginning of our marriage. I don't know what it is that inspired us to get together, but it was like this mutual attraction and knowledge that we have the same values. And now it's kind of ironed out because I am teaching people on my masterclasses, especially the polarity one, things that I learned. The reason I know these things is because I almost kill myself doing the opposite. I chased guys that I, I was not right for. I did all the wrong things. I had all the desperate energy. I had all the masculinity. And even with my husband who was so into me, I almost pushed him away. So if you go onto my website, you will see the Polarity Masterclass. If you read about it, that's all the things that I learned and that's how I shifted my life. So it's not just out of nowhere that I come up with it. It, it was a learning process of reading, doing my diploma in life coaching and doing all these things 
that really shifted it. How has Leo been handling the fact that he is going to be a big brother? Look, I think for a child, especially his age, he doesn't really understand the reality i mean i didn't understand when i was 31 and i had leo what the reality of a baby is so let's ask him when it actually arrives because right now i think he thinks it's a gimmick it's a joke we're all having a laugh but wait till he understands the reality of it i think he is going to have a very different understanding of what all of that means what is your husband's occupation my husband's occupation is orthopedic surgeon Tips on starting a podcast or Instagram, where to start. I will tell you one thing of how I started, and I hope that gives you a tip. I was working in the industry and doing Instagram and things for many, many years, and I did grow a following, but it was like pulling teeth. It was difficult. And then TikTok came out in 2020. I got into it in like 2022, very late, but I finished my diploma in life coaching and I thought nobody knows me on TikTok as you know the girl who's talking about life development and feminine energy let me just go on there and put out a video every day I went on there put a video out every day and within a year I got to 800,000 followers now it's not about follow account it's more about engagement and all that stuff and this is not a vanity metric I'm not trying to show off but the point I'm trying to illustrate is that before it was like pulling teeth and then suddenly it was easy. How and what was the difference? It was in the fact that my content was needed and necessary and timely. I am not saying that to stroke my own ego or to pat myself on the back. I'm just saying that as a one can see from the evidence that people wanted to hear what I was talking about. When I was talking about lifestyle and fashion and beauty, there were lots of people who were talking about that kind of content and I'm not the best. In fact, I really like to wear a bump suit at the moment, which if you don't know about is the best for pregnancy. I like to wear a shirt over it and that's it. If I start to wear, make fashion content, I wouldn't be being myself. Myself is a pretty simple person with a lot of like when it comes to dressing, but with a lot of ideas in my head. I've always got something to talk about. I've always got something to express. I've always got an idea at the tip of my tongue. I'm always into self-improvement. I want to help people do that. And I have very, very strong ideas about polarity, masculinity, femininity, and I really believe in marriage and making that thrive. So my tip to you is if you have something to give, start a podcast, start an Instagram, start a TikTok, start a YouTube channel. People will come to you because you have that thing to give in abundance and it will change their lives. And once it does, they will subscribe. That is my tip. How do you and your husband maintain intimacy with kids? I think you have to find a youthful joy and a genuine indulgence and love for parenting and being in this young child stage. It's not the flying to Paris. It's not the flying to Vegas. It's not the, you know, it can be. You can do it however you want it. But both me and my husband are so into enjoying these little creatures. We've only got one, but we'll have two soon. Knock on wood. Um, to enjoy. Like, this is such a fleeting time. There are toys everywhere around me right now. Because the choice was clean them up or make this content. And I'd rather talk to you. I'm a communicator and it's about people. It's about growth and it's about connection. So for me, that's what it's about. And I'm lucky that my husband was made to be a dad. He thrives in it. By made to be a dad, I don't mean he changes every diaper. I don't mean he's there at my beck and call. No, I don't mean that. It's mainly my job. But he just sees the value in providing for a family and being the father figure in, in the family. So if you have... a playfulness about it and at the same time a legacy to it I believe that there isn't any thing bad about it it's quite exciting to grow something together is there a reason you're so smart about things is it because you've had a rough past I would rephrase it as tough instead of rough because rough indicates to me almost like a gritty tumultuous past I've not been married before 
I've not had, you know, a rough, you know, upbringing, but I've had a tough life in terms of being an immigrant when I was very young and not speaking the language when I came to England, as in not having a father in my life or family except for my mum, as in watching her struggle to provide for me, as in all those things which create for a tough upbringing, but I wouldn't say a rough one. Like, it's been a little bit tough. And I've had to learn a lot of things that I suppose one might learn, but in a very different way. Which is why I have the tips and the knowledge, because I've had to learn it. If I didn't have to learn it, I wouldn't know how to teach it. Last question is, what have you done for work over the years? My first job was in a restaurant called Sticky Fingers, which is a Rolling Stones restaurant. If you know the reference to the album, you know. It, it was like a burger joint and ribs or whatever when I was 16, 17 years old. Then I went to drama school and in order to have money while at drama school, I worked in nightclubs on the door, serving bottles, things like that. So I'd go to school in the day and then I'd work in the nightclubs at night. Um, after I left drama school, I did theater, I did plays, I did television, uh, things like The Bill and Doctors. And later on, I did Home and Away when I came to Australia, just bit parts and things like that. I then never wanted or designed to be a model because I never saw myself that way. But I fell into modeling because acting work wasn't always around. So I did commercial modeling. I did Miss Universe. I got opportunities from that. I worked in Playboy as a Playboy bunny for the longest time. And then once I came to Australia, I started working in modeling full time until I got a job presenting for real estate show, which was like homes, you know, when you see luxurious homes and there's a presenter on there taking you around the home. Some were for sale, some were just for viewings. So I became a real estate presenter. I would write the scripts. I would tour these homes and I would make videos, not myself, a whole production. It was like a whole team in production. And that's what I did. And then I did a diploma in coaching and that's what I'm doing right now. So those were my jobs, a lot of hustling, but like Steve Jobs said, there's a lot of dots that come together in order to make who you are now. But profession wise, I've got a bachelor's in arts. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. I lasted long enough to make, to talk for 40 minutes. I hope it wasn't too laborsome to listen to me. Thank you so much for everybody who subscribes who likes, who gives a five star review, who is there, because if you don't show up, it's hard for me to show up and you make it very easy. So thank you. I see you. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.